Hello, Jonda. Hello, Kevin. In the last video, we were talking about rules and how rules, you, you need to have rules based on how you want to move or act in the future. Uh, how do, so how do rules relate to the understanding someone has of the mechanisms? Because if you're going to have rules of movement, then you would need to understand how the mechanisms work and your rules will be based on your understanding, whether that's uh, correct or not. So can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yes, um, that's exactly correct. We, we absolutely need an understanding of the mechanisms we are working with in order to uh, make sense of rules. First of all, I'm going to remind people that um, uh, the initial Alexander technique was all about reasoning and applying reasoning in activity. It was about uh, using verbal instructions in order to direct or uh, coordinated movements and uh, how to prevent unwanted movements to, well, take over. That is, we are discussing a reason way of directing the movements of the different parts of the organism. And we are not relying on what we feel in order to, uh, well, accomplish most acts. So this said, uh, we, we have to discuss uh, the movements and uh, there is a special case which uh, uh, was really present, pregnant in the first uh, articles and books written by FM Alexander. It's the, the idea of the true primary movement in every act. And um, I wanted to start with this because I've been stimulated recently. There has been an article that has been published by uh, Ekdal, is a modern Alexander teacher uh, from the North country. I don't know exactly which. Uh, it's got um, a blog post that is called Alexander Technique. Uh, you will see it uh, because I have uh, the first quote is, uh, is from his blog and uh, is citing uh, uh, an article written by uh, a journalist for Alexander, or written by Alexander in 1904. And uh, it's quite interesting to see what he makes of the primary movement. His article is, is called The Primary Movement, and he explains his views on the primary movement. Um, of course, complaining that most teachers don't read Alexander's book uh, sufficiently or accurately enough to understand what is there. But you will find that uh, in the end, uh, I totally disagree with uh, his views. I see different things in the text that he does. So uh, it's quite interesting to have a contrast, a critical uh, aspect of things. So let's start with, uh, with this idea of primary movement. So Alexander says that, uh, th that's the sentence, and the sentence is, uh, is in the blog post I was talking about, like alexandertechnikblogspot.com by Ekdal. And um, uh, there is a part that is what Alexander writes, and the other is the comment that is made by Ekdal. So what Alexander says is that the primary, primary movement of breathing must be thoracic. That is the thorax or chest box must be expanded naturally without drawing in any breath by suction. The thorax must be made as mobile as possible. Out of this sentence, Ekdal continues and uh, comments that uh, it turns out that the primary movement was part of Alexander vocabulary years before the 1907 article. It's another article that he's discussing, a very interesting one. And uh, that is absolutely correct. The, the term primary movement was, uh, was uh, there and was present in Alexander discourse much before uh, his, even his first book in 1910. And then um, Ekdal said that the meaning is expli explicitly clear. It is uh, the movement of the thorax in breathing. So 
what Ekdal is saying is that uh, the primary movement of breathing is the movement of the thorax in breathing, which does not make much sense if you think about it a second. Primary is before. Uh, so it's something that is constituent of breathing, but that is not breathing for me. And so the primary movement of breathing must be thoracic. The expansion of the thorax is a concept that is most of the time misconstrued, like here by Ekdal, that thinking that uh, for Alexander, the expansion of the thorax is uh, what we most of the time consider as the movements of the, of the ribs, which is uh, the sideways movement of expansion and contraction. I'm going to show you that uh, it is not the case, that uh, the primary movement of breathing must be th thoracic, that is the thoracic poise must be changed. For Alexander, it's, uh, it's absolutely out of the question to uh, learn to expand the ribs more or to do anything about the expansion. The primary uh, movement uh, is to obtain the poise of the chest and you will see the poise of the chest relatively to the chin. It will, it will turn out that uh, expanding, breathing, making more uh, like what uh, uh, has really turned the eyes of Ekdal is the motive power. Uh, you understand the motive power as being the movement of the ribs in breathing. Well, he forgets that uh, Alexander had uh, a, a pharynx problem, what we call a throat problem. And uh, a throat problem uh, is, uh, is not because there is not enough air pressure, but most of the time that uh, the larynx is not organized in such a way that uh, uh, the passage of air is not going to irritate the muscles. So I'm going to uh, separate this uh, intervention in two parts. The first part is going to be uh, just uh, looking uh, at the general idea of primary movement and poise of the chest. What is uh, for me the poise of the chest and what it is not. Uh, it's very, very simple to show what it is not. There are so many examples. And the second part will be much more technical. We are going to look at, uh, it, in fact, I said that this, uh, talk would be about the anatomical part. But I, because of this uh, uh, event, that uh, text on the primary movement, I thought, yes, it, it's better to start with the basics and then go, go on to the second part. And I think the second part will be too much for today. So it's going to be the next time. So let's, uh, let's have a look. So um, in his pamphlet, uh, Why We Breathe Incorrectly, in uh, 1909, Alexander wrote, let me make myself clear by explaining that the man who breathes incorrectly and inadequately does so as an immediate and inevitable consequence of abnormal and harmful conditions of certain parts of his body. The man who breathes correctly and adequately does so as an immediate and inevitable consequence of normal and salubrious conditions of the same parts. So I, I have here uh, for me Alexander's explanation about um, primary conditions, primary movement, the primary movement of breathing is not the movement of the ribs. It's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's clear that you can make uh, movements of the ribs with uh, abnormal and harmful conditions of certain parts of the body. So for me, I don't understand uh, harmful condition of parts. I understand harmful condition uh, between the movements of the parts that create uh, geometric conditions 
of the parts of the rotor, so relatively to one another, and also relatively to the geometric position of the head. So th this is not about uh, a, a primary movement seen as moving the ribs, as the primary movement of breathing. The ribs belong to the mechanism of the torso, and the condition of use of the mechanism of the torso are uh, primary to the different movements you're making with the ribs. So uh, stating that the primary movement of breathing is the movement of the thorax in breathing makes no sense for me. Yeah. Uh, there are conditions that need to be organized for the movement of expansion and contraction of the ribs to happen correctly. And this, has no, this cannot be sorted by telling somebody to move the ribs or to uh, stop blocking the movement of the ribs. You, you may ask somebody to think about it and uh, the person will well, maybe say yes out of kindness for your incapacity to teach. But uh, here we, we will see that uh, it's absolutely necessary to understand the mechanism for the mechanism to start working correctly. So uh, the next part is to look at we, what we are talking about, harmful conditions of the movements of the parts or harmful condition created by the movements of the parts. So I have, I have taken an image from uh, a, a blog, another blog from uh, this time, a gentleman, a teacher of the Alexander Technique, and he's explaining, uh, it's a very short article, you will see there is the, uh, the address at the top, and uh, he's explaining how to sit and uh, how to uh, solve the neck problem is in working with a computer. It's quite, uh, it's quite funny. And so um, I have two images next to each other. On the left, there is a 1951 uh, image taken from the film where Alexander is, uh, in fact, uh, manipulating a pupil. And here we see uh, what uh, uh, should be, I think, the, when you publish an image on the block spot of the Alexander Technique, you are, you are in fact, showing what is, uh, what is accurate or what is right. And uh, when I look at these images, for me, they are completely uh, different. And uh, what is the difference? The difference is the poise of the chest. And the difference is the idea of uh, uh, how to use the antagonistic action. I don't think that uh, Johnson is using antagonistic action principle at all. Uh, I do believe that Alexander is exactly displaying what he means by antagonistic action. And so, uh, of course, uh, there are uh, conditions for breathing. And when the middle back is thrown forward and the top of the torso is thrown back, you can see these two red arrows are showing uh, what I imagine are the movements of these parts. In order to create these posture in sitting, the person must have been some uh, same movements while going to sit, while going uh, to sit upright from the leaning forward position. And so it's me, it seems that when the person, uh, well, move to sit upright, uh, she's moving backward much faster with the top of the torso than with the lower sternum, for example. We can see clearly that uh, there is a, a very strong retraction of the upper thoracic spine. As a result, the cervical spine is very, very far back. For some people, they, they like to see this, this kind of images because they think that is, this is what we mean by lengthening. So there is a very, very erect cervical spine, as you can see. Um, and um, it's totally different from uh, the results of FM Alexander's manipulation. So, it, it, well, some people think that Alexander is wrong. And uh, 
and then why teach under the name of Alexander Technik if it's the case? Uh, this is a point I've never, uh, never saw. Uh, well, it's not for me to solve, of course, but uh, uh, we see here that the upper thoracic spine, yes, the spine that is uh, going right up to the base of the neck is really inclined forward. And uh, this is different, of course, from this uh, disposition of the parts. And uh, the poise of the chest the poise of the thorax is completely different. What I'm going to demonstrate is that uh, this has a direct link with uh, the origin of the Alexander technique. You, know, you remember that uh, FM Alexander uh, wanted to evolve a reeducation uh, process in order to solve voice problems. And uh, I have discovered that effectively having uh, the upper torso so far back and the middle torso so far protruded forward uh, creates conditions for uh, the airways and for the larynx and for the pharynx. And this is the, the technical aspect that I'm going to dwell about on the next video. For the moment, I'm just looking at the poise of the chest. I assume that this person is making movement with the different parts of the torso. And the antagonistic movement she is doing are conducing to a certain position that is uh, exactly the opposite of the primary movement in breathing. Uh, the primary movement of breathing is to create conditions where uh, the sternum, apparently, is uh, vertical in the upright position. It's the first thing I will look at when I uh, observe a student. When I observe a student, most of the time, I am like Alexander, uh, looking at the student from the side, and I observe how the student is wearing the shoulders. You will see the shoulders are where very far backward of the ribs. Alexander said that they should be forward of the ribs. Here they are not what he said he wrote uh, in uh, Man's Supreme Inheritance, that when you wear your shoulders backward relatively to the ribs, you are in a position of uh, incapacity. So before looking at how the person is moving ribs, you must look at how the different parts of the torso are organized and whether this organization affects the movement of the ribs. But more importantly, well, you, you can have a maximum motive power, but if for some reason you create an obstruction of the upper airways, well, you're going to try and get air no matter what because uh, breathing is fundamental. So you're going to accelerate the air and increase the voice problem. And so what is primary before uh, asking the person to breathe? Very often I hear uh, teachers saying that uh, uh, expand your thorax by taking a breath, by breathing. Well, uh, you must understand that when you project the middle torso far forward of the upper torso like it is seen here. You are in fact widening the front of the thorax. The, the, the front part of the rib cage is really opening when you are uh, set in such organization. But you must also measure, this is very easy to do. You can uh, open your finger and uh, away from the thumbs, make a sort of uh, uh, measuring mechanism and put it on the lower front of the rib cage and uh, well imitate this uh, young student and you will find that as soon as you organize these antagonistic movements that are pointed in red to show that uh, I consider that they are wrong conditions well then you will find that the front of the rib cage is going to explain and at the same time, if you revert the position and place the sum very far back against the back of the ribs, you will find that uh, in these conditions, the back is really narrow. The, 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 the width of the back of the rib cage is, uh, is reduced and the rib cage becomes 
quite rigid. That is what Alexander is explaining when he says that uh, uh, the antagonistic movement is primary. The antagonistic action of the part is going to create a mobility in the rib cage. We don't measure mobility by, move, by touching the ribs. We measure mobility by just uh, looking at how the student is going to organize the parts. Uh, it's quite a, a different idea that um, uh, what is the principle of antagonistic action? What, what is it? What is the rule that is behind it? Well, uh, you can see the rule on, uh, well, it's an image of you, I think. You are, well, it's you doing a, a session. And uh, it's a session where you're exploring how to use verbal instructions to create a complex antagonistic action. On this particular uh, session, there, there is a, you're, you're using a ruler uh, to measure how much the torso can move without the chin following. Uh, there, there is no action to try and get the head forward. The whole idea be, behind this uh, procedure is to uh, see how one can get the head to be very far forward and upward relatively to the back of the torso without ever moving the head. So there is a, a ruler that is lightly placed against the cheek and uh, just to, to check whether uh, when you are directing the movement backward of the middle torso and off the hips, Alexander said hips as far back as is possible, but in fact, you, you, it's not two movements one after the other. The, these two movements have to occur at the same time. Otherwise, if one movement occur before the other one, what will happen is that there, is, there will be immediately an effect on the stature, on the height of the torso. And we will see that if ever the person will accelerate one movement more than the other, then there will be a shortening of the back. And so on this picture, we see what we mean by antagonistic action. Antagonistic action is principle, but, it, but the idea can be made real. A, a student can use his, his own mind and uh, start to employ intentions, start to create intentions. So we see on this picture that yes, uh, there can, the poise of the chest can be changed. So that's uh, exactly following uh, Alexander's sentence. At present, I simply state, he's talking about the reeducation of the breathing mechanism. At present, I simply state the great principle to be antagonistic action perfect employment of which is the forerunner of that control which ensures the correct use of the muscular system of the thorax in its fullest sense as a primary motive power in the respiratory act, also adequate muscular development, non-interference with the larynx and nasal dilatation. So we are going to see that, uh, yes, uh, depending on the poise of the chest, depending on the use of the antagonistic actions, you will uh, more or less obstruct the airways, create incorrect conditions for the air to enter the lungs, or you will create absolute perfect conditions. This, is a, this has to be demonstrated, but for the moment, the correct use of the muscular system of the thorax is not the correct use of the movement, uh, sideways movements of the ribs. It's, uh, it's clear that uh, there is use of the, the antagonistic action. Even uh, here is a picture I have uh, taken from another block spot, but I can't remember which. So that's why I, uh, in fact, uh, I the, the, visit, the, the face of people that are on it. But what I wanted to show is that uh, I consider on this picture 
it's a breathing session with a teacher that is asking a student to 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 read something and certainly speak aloud uh, it is seen that there is a use of uh, the principle of antagonistic action and that use can be made without knowing of course what you see here is an incorrect use of the antagonistic principle there are uh, obviously movements that are occurring to create that disposition and poise of the chest but they are, of course, incorrect. And um, this is something I always look at, and you can use that guideline when you observe yourself on a video recording. You will always, well, have a relationship in space between the chin. The chin is the origin of the, uh, the tongue, and the tongue is an uh, integral part to the breathing airways. And so the, the root of the tongue and uh, the middle of the torso are seen to be above one another. As I said before, this retraction of the upper thoracic spine leads to a very, very straight neck. It's the straight neck posture, I call it. It's the plumb line posture. If you look, the back of the head is very, very close to uh, the shoulder blades, but uh, the middle of the back is forward of it. The person is protruding the abdomen. And so Alexander said that uh, the adequate breather uh, is the one that, well, can create the primary movement in breathing. And uh, here, it is not the case. Apparently, uh, the teacher follows the idea that the head uh, position is uh, fundamental and uh, there is no regard for the primary movement. And the primary movement is the capacity to organize the, the poise of the chest, which is to organize the movements of the different parts of the torso. And when you organize the movements of the different parts of the torso, as Alexander uh, is showing on this picture, you see that the chin is very far forward. So it's very far forward of, of course, the middle torso. But uh, uh, what is going to be of importance is the opening of the pharynx, the opening of the airways, and you will find that uh, uh, when the chin is so close to the larynx, it's, uh, I, I look at it, I look where the chin is, where um, the pharynx is. The pharynx is the top of the trachea and the back of the tongue. So it's going to be quite interesting to, to start to look at this and think, okay, the distance between the chin and the pharynx is very short and the pharynx looks to be very high. All these questions uh, are linked with um, Alexander's solution. He says the process by which you make an adequate breather, breather is achieved simply by a readjustment of the parts of the torso by a new and correct use of the muscular mechanism through the directive agent of the sphere of consciousness. So this is what I was uh, describing. I, I described that it's possible for a person to make a, a correct use of uh, uh, the antagonistic action principle by using intentions of movements and uh, by, well, controlling with an objective system like a video uh, recording to see whether uh, in the process, the poise of the chest has been changed and the distance between the chin and the front of the torso has been in fact increased in the correct direction. Um, Alexander is making a, uh, a very long description of uh, the incorrect use of antagonistic action. He says that the posture assumed in standing, so that we have a standing pupil, is the posture assumed in standing is incorrect. And he said that the center of gravity is thrown too far back. 
So uh, the, the idea that the center of gravity is from too far back is uh, difficult to understand on this image uh, unless you, you manipulate the idea somehow. Uh, well, of course, I do manipulate ideas all the time. And so I started to think, well, uh, the center of gravity of the whole structure or the center of gravity of what? And um, uh, on this image, uh, of course, the center of gravity of the torso is thrown very far back because the whole weight of the head, the weight of the shoulder, uh, the weight of the, uh, the arms and top of the chest are thrown backward relative to the middle torso. So in that case, yes, I can understand that Alexander would say that the center of gravity is uh, thrown too far back. But he continues the second point. He says that the position of the shoulders, uh, no, the position of the shoulder blade and upper chest poise is secured mainly by stiffening the arms. You must understand that the shoulder blades being so far back are in fact narrow. They are, they are pulled toward the spine. So this gentleman is, uh, uh, I think without his knowledge, is really narrowing the upper torso. That um, may not strike any chord in your uh, representation of the mechanisms, but uh, next time we are going to see how much the shoulder blades movements are fundamental for opening the airways. Uh, there is a direct link between the larynx and the shoulder blade. Well, it's a direct link with the height of the larynx and the movement backward of the shoulder blades. The more the shoulder blades are backward, uh, the more the larynx is going to be upward and forward. And we will see that this position of the larynx has never been uh, a position for breathing. It's a position for a completely different function, which we call swallowing. So the position of the shoulder blade and upper chest poise is uh, secured by stiffening the arms. Uh, you must understand that the arm is a pendulum. The arm is uh, hanging from the top. So the pendulum is uh, for a young man like this, it must be seven, seven or eight kilos. Uh, well, something like 15 pounds. It's a lot of weight, yeah? And so you look at the, the orientation of the arm and you discover that the whole upper arm and lower arm and lower arm are very far forward of the axis of rotation. Well, the arm is not hanging vertically as any pendulum at rest hangs. So it's, it, it's, it's absolutely clear that you can deduce from this picture that the muscles of the shoulder are really supporting, well, the weight of the pendulum all the while. And so uh, there is here uh, an act that is continuous, yes? Uh, this arm is not wearing, is not uh, holding any book. This arm is, uh, what, what is he doing with the, uh, with the arm? And so this act of constantly holding the arms causes, as I, I'm reading what Alexander is saying, it causes undue rigidity of the neck, displacement of the shoulder blades, while shortening, decrease in height, more or less sinking of the loin, loins. The, the loins are, uh, uh, well, just the lower back, the sinking of the loin and increased curve of the lumbar spine. Uh, there is no question. There is an increased curve of the lumbar spine. It is seen that the sacrum is very, very much further backward than the mid thoracic, the mid lumbar. Uh, spine. So this man is uh, really shortening the stature, is not lengthening the back, is not widening the upper torso, is narrowing. So uh, this is strange that uh, the Alexander, the modern Alexander teacher that has been trained with the somatic uh, knowledge that has uh, uh, been manipulated by our own teachers is absolutely unaware of what's occurring. 
how is the chest pose? Well, well, it's obvious that the student is using the voice mechanism because this is a, a lesson in speaking. So uh, Alexander says there is an absolute lack of antagonistic action in the use of the respiratory mechanism. This is a picture where there is an absolute lack of antagonistic action in the use of the respiratory mechanism. Well, the sentence is very strange. Uh, it should have uh, written something a bit different to make sense. It should have said that there is an absolute lack of reason use of the antagonistic action in the use of the respiratory mechanism. Because uh, uh, there is an antagonistic action, all right, it's just creating, it's just that the direction of this uh, principle is not part of their mindset. They're absolutely not uh, looking at it. I, I don't know what the lesson is about, but it's certainly not about the poise of the chest. It's certainly not about the relative position of the torso to the chin. It's obvious. It's like um, uh, a completely strange uh, session where everything that Alexander has written is uh, not taken in consideration. The difficulty being that uh, I don't think that that teacher was never explained uh, what is meant by antagonistic action uh, or lack of antagonistic action in the use of the respiratory mechanism. The respiratory mechanism is working all the time, no matter what condition you are uh, creating. We can create positive conditions or absolute incorrect condition. Now, these incorrect conditions, Alexander makes a fifth comment, and he says that this leads to uh, an attitude of mind toward the inspiratory act that is incorrect. Uh, the inspiratory act, yes, has to take place in these conditions. And uh, I, will go in, I, I will demonstrate in our next session that uh, this uh, use of the antagonistic action principle leads to uh, voice and uh, larynx, pharynx problem, uh, which are easily explained. As I said, there are two functions. One function is to open the larynx, now we call this breathing. And there is no, another function that is even more fundamental than opening the larynx. It is closing the larynx. And so uh, closing the larynx is uh, vital because if you swallow or uh, inhale any sort of liquid or solid into the airways, you are at a risk of dying. Uh, you can die by obstruction if the, uh, the lump is, that is going into the pharynx is too big, or you are at a risk also of uh, pneumonia, which is an infection, uh, well, lethal in infection of the, of the lungs that happen when something is uh, going through uh, the trachea and into the lungs. So closing the voice mechanism and opening the voice mechanisms are independent from, well, the movement of the ribs, the lower movement of the ribs uh, sideways. Uh, not, of course, in my demonstration of the antagonistic action, Alexander makes a point to uh, explain that uh, when the ribs move, the vertebrae that are associated with his ribs are going to move when you discuss the forward and backward movement. So when you see a person that the lumbar spine is uh, uh, pushed forward in an increased curve, you can be certain that the ribs that are attached to uh, the spine, just above it, are going to be pulled forward. And Alexander explains that uh, uh, by lengthening the spine, what we mean is creating actions on the ribs. It's possible to uh, 
create an intention of the move, of movements of the of the ribs. For example, you can imagine, and so many times you've seen, uh, well, senior teacher placing their hands on the side of the rib cage, the lower part of the rib cage, and moving that rib cage backward. Well, obviously they had a hand somewhere else to well create the conditions of rotation of the rib cage. In this image, you must understand, I see the rib cage as rotated forward at the bottom and backward at the top. That's what I explained earlier. When the upper ribs are thrown so far back, well, it's obvious that the vertebrae, the top thoracic vertebrae are thrown backward. As a result, the cervical spine is also thrown backward. And as a result, the head is backward. And there is no little movement of the head around the joint uh, of the top of the spine that can change this fact. So the attitude of mind toward the inspiratory act is incorrect. What he, the person thinks that by just uh, uh, taking in air, the person is breathing. Uh, and this, Alexander explained, will, well, will create sniffing and gasping inspiration. They say that sniffing and gasping inspiration is the rule. This causes an abnormal lowering of the air pressure in the respiratory tract, which is more than harmful, since it's tend to cause congestion of the mucous membrane on the sucker principle, setting, um, setting up catar and its attendant evidence. Uh, well, um, I'm not going to explain this uh, today, but I think it's absolutely necessary to make sense of uh, that uh, fifth point where Alexander is talking about the sucker uh, principle. Uh, uh, I maintain that these conditions of poise of the chest is uh, creating in itself uh, the, all the conditions for the sucker principle to apply. And uh, this is very important to understand that the primary movement uh, in breathing or the primary movement in, if you want, in every act as, bring, as breathing is part of our life. If you, if you stop breathing for a few minutes, you will understand what I mean. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not conducive to good health. So breathing is necessary all the time. So the, prime, the true primary movement in every act is creating conditions for the poise of the chest and the relationship between, as we will see, the chest, the shoulder blades, and uh, well, the tongue, the chin. So we, we have here, uh, well, a, a very clear description by Alexander of uh, the incorrect uh, movements. And it's absolutely obvious that uh, when you look around you and you look at uh, uh, these uh, sessions of Alexander Technique, uh, well, the proper mechanical advantage is, seen, is not seen anywhere. Uh, the antagonistic action that are, uh, so here we, you have a, a teacher of teacher and uh, of the modern Alexander Technique and we see her, her Rib cage and or rib cage poise above uh, the pelvis, and uh, this is a student, I imagine. And when I look at this image, at these images, I think, wow, that's that's very strange because uh, uh, there is no uh, use of the principle of the antagonistic action uh, for good. Uh, I don't think they they, they care really much. And so we will see in the next session how uh, the position of the shoulder blade is important. And so we see that uh, both of the uh, uh, people are, of course, lifting the arms because, in fact, uh, the teacher is placing hands on the top of the uh, rib cage of the student, but the student herself is uh, placing the hands on another person that is in front. So they are lifting the hands in front of them. And when they lift their hands in front of them, we see that, uh, well, once again, uh, the positions uh, that is the effect of the coordination of the movement of the different parts of the torso is exactly the same as the one described by Alexander. Uh, 
And so I want to attract your attention because this is going to be very important in our next technical session. We see that uh, the shoulders are very high. Uh, they, they are, uh, well, significantly higher than the top of the sternum bone. And uh, when you see this, you must imagine how much the person is, uh, is lifting the shoulders. And uh, you must understand that the muscle lifting the shoulders are connected to the head. They are the neck muscles. So this person is shortening the neck muscles in order to lift the head. Is that necessary? Is that uh, natural? Well, we will find that uh, the point uh, in, well, in question is that according to the breathing mechanism conditions, it's incorrect to lift the shoulders when you lift the hands. You are reducing the air uh, passage. You are creating exactly what Alexander was, was talking about. Uh, these persons, I do not imagine one second that they do, do this on purpose. I think it's more a question of not understanding the mechanism, having the attention placed completely elsewhere on the feelings, certainly, but not on any reasoning about the system. And uh, uh, when they are lifting the ribs so far back of the middle torso, you must try and, and imagine what it is, you see, uh, then uh, the sucker principle is in action. You can bet that these people are sucking air at the end of sentences, like ah, uh, you hear sometimes these hissing sounds. And so um, Alexander explained his technique as a technique of change. And he said that uh, this change brings about a proper mechanical advantage of all the parts concerned and causes, thanks to the right employment of the relative machinery, such so expansion and contraction of the thoracic cavity as to give atmospheric pressure its opportunity. And so uh, this is one of the sentences used by um, Mr. Egdal uh, in his uh, blog about the primary movements uh, to show that uh, the expansion and contraction of the thoracic cavity are of for him, uh, of course, the, the contraction and expansion of uh, the side ribs. The ribs have to move like in a bucket handle movement uh, and uh, close to breathe out and expand to breathe in. And uh, this has nothing to do with giving atmospheric pressure its opportunity. For the atmospheric pressure to occur and uh, exert is, uh, its force, it's necessary to have an open, uh, an open vacuum. You can create the vacuum in, in, inside of the lungs, but all rest upon opening the airways. And uh, we, we will discover in our next episode that uh, the mechanism, the understanding of the mechanism is such that uh, this is more a closing of the upper airways than anything else. It's uh, incorrect conditions for atmospheric pressure to have its opportunity. So the expansion of the upper torso is not obtained. There is a, a fantastic expansion of the front of the lower rib cage. And uh, for Alexander, this uh, uh, we will see also as to be changed. We want uh, contraction but we want a definite expansion at the back of the rib cage, especially at the lower part of the back of the rib cage. And uh, obviously in these sessions, uh, these people must be involved in something very interesting, very uh, tactile and uh, friendly, but um, their understanding of uh, the use of the mechanism, their understanding of certain expansions and contraction uh, are not there. And the result known as breathing for Alexander is not there. Alexander says, you see, yes, uh, singing teacher are teaching breathing, but there is breathing and breathing. So we have here the notion that there is breathing and breathing.
it will at once be seen, therefore, that the act of breathing is not a primary or even a secondary part of the process, which is really reeducation of the kinesthetic system associated with correct bodily posture and respiration and will be referred to universally as such in the near future. As a matter of fact, given the perfect coordination of parts as required by my system, breathing is a subordinate operation which will perform itself. So you must uh, compare uh, this uh, sentence by Alexander, yes, uh, that is in Man Supreme Inheritance, with Egdal's idea that the primary movement of breathing is uh, the breathing movement of the ribs sideways, up and down. Uh, for Alexander, uh, the act of breathing is not primary. So if the act of breathing is not primary, how is it that the primary movement of breathing could be uh, the act of breathing itself? No, uh, there are movements that can be, uh, in fact, directed consciously to obtain uh, an expansion of the thorax, the thorax that has nothing to do with the expansion that you can get with the movement, the sideways movement of the ribs. And uh, these movements of expansion of the thorax that we call, that we obtain uh, by directing antagonistic actions, uh, these movements are for opening the voice box and uh, also making sure that the closing of the voice box is going to be efficient, which is not the case when the posture, uh, when the, psych, uh, the cycle of breathing as people imagine it, as uh, some modern Alexander apparently imagine it, uh, is completely uh, incorrect. It's completely impossible to either open the airways or close the airways. So on this picture, uh, this is uh, to well, give you an idea of what we are going to discuss uh, next week. Uh, you see two tubes and uh, the drawing is uh, imperfect. I will explain that uh, in breathing, there is a, a mm -hmm. flap at the top of the larynx. This is the larynx you're seeing here. And at the top of it, there is a flap called the epiglottis. The epiglottis is attached to the tongue. The function of the epiglottis is, uh, is not shown here and the blue arrow is completely uh, impossible to understand, is that the epiglottis is there to close the airway. We have uh, uh, this mechanism to make certain that when we chew something or when we drink a liquid, a liquid, that liquid does not enter the airways in blue. There is a red part here and the, the first part is uh, of course the laryngopharynx and the laryngopharynx is common, is a part both of the airways and of the food tract. At the back of it you have the food tract. And uh, this image relates the wrong use of the mechanism because on this image, you see the epiglottis as vertical. So when the epiglottis is more or less, it's not fully open here, but it's nearly fully open. When the uh, airways are fully open, uh, the epiglottis is really vertical. It's not like this. Yes, this is off half closed or, uh, well, uh, one third closed, yes? At the back, of course, you have the laryngopharynx and uh, this laryngopharynx connects with, uh, well, the upper sphincter of the esophagus. But where this image is totally wrong is uh, it leaves the impression that the two tubes are open. This should never happen. We will see that. We will see that when a person is breathing, there are more than two thirds of the F esophagus that is completely flat, completely closed. To get the opening of the upper sphincter of the esophagus, of course, you need to get your larynx, what you call the voice box, 
very far forward to your chin. Yes? And so uh, this would be uh, the problem Alexander, this could describe Alexander's problem is that he didn't know how to, in fact, open the epiglottis sufficiently. He didn't know that the movement of the shoulder blades and the movements of the different parts of the torso as they are acting on the sternum, in fact, influence the opening of the epiglottis. And he, he didn't know either that uh, the same disposition of the parts can in fact lead to an half closed airways and half open esophagus, which means that uh, uh, the person will have difficulty breathing in. So the person will make a sniffing or gasping effort at the end of expiration at all time that this will lead to a, the, the sucker principle that Alexander was talking about. That is, if you suck air into a tube that is floppy, all this uh, red uh, uh, is, uh, muscle is floppy when it's shortened. So when the person is wearing the lower sternum very far forward, we will see that the tendency is to shorten the pharynx when you breathe air into a floppy tube and you accelerate the air, you have, uh, well, it's not the sucker principle, it's the venturi principle that is going to, with the acceleration of air, reduce the pressure inside and have a tendency to stick the parts together have a tendency to draw the muckers, draw the, uh, the, the, the uh, water that is inside this tissue out and cre creating even more clogging and creating when there is clogging and water into the airways and into the mouth, it will uh, start to uh, start a, a wrong uh, set of actions where the person is going to swallow too many times, the, the person is going to clear the throat too many times. And in this way, the different positions of the muscles uh, that are attached to the rib cage are going to have a tremendous uh, negative effect on the breathing airways opening or closing. This is what I'm going to explain in our next, uh, in our next interview. For the moment, uh, I think I've made the things clear. The primary principle is the organization of the movements of the parts of the torso you will see relative to the chin in order to create uh, absolute breathing condition and very fast and uh, automatic uh, swallowing condition. So if you do not uh, understand these rules, it's more most of the time because you have never been taught uh, how this is working. Uh, this is a difficulty with the modern Alexander technique is that uh, they believe that uh, they get the uh, feeling in their hands of what are the correct conditions for the different mechanism for breathing, for example, for swallowing but um, the hands are going to tell you nothing about it as uh, uh, the picture we've seen where somatic tissues are performing some adjustment of the head, being completely unaware that uh, the, prim the primary act, uh, the primary principle in every act is completely, well, uh, askew, completely incorrect. Okay, and, so for people watching the video, if you go underneath, there's a link and you can go to Jean Doe's website or to Facebook and book a lesson with him. And we'll see you in the next video. Thanks, Jean Doe. Thank you, Kevin.